Hello and welcome. My name is Barkha Dath. You're watching the Mojo Story. We're continuing to keep our focus on the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been our priority for the last 15 months. We now have a call out of the Modi government's performance in handling the India's second wave from no less than the Lancet. The Lancet in these comments is calling out the fact that Prime Minister Modi's actions to stifle criticism are inexcusable, inexcusable rather. Lancet goes on to say in comments that have been picked up across the world that India has squandered an early success in controlling COVID-19. Now, these are extremely damning words that are coming from the world's most respected medical journal. And of course, it is also calling India's vaccination policy as botched and falling apart at the center. In fact, Lancet goes on to quote other modelers to say that we could be looking at a staggering increase in death rate, but the Modi government is still more intent on removing criticism than the pandemic. We do have some projection for what these numbers could look like. And the Lancet is saying th there's a possibility of a staggering 1 million deaths by the 1st of August. And yet the Lancet is saying, what is the government doing about any of this at all? If this happens, the Lancet says, the Modi government would be responsible for presiding over a self-inflicted national catastrophe. So on the program today, is this something we can do? And what can the past teach us? We're joined on the program by Chinmay Tumbe, one of the foremost authors and historians when it comes to chronicling the age of pandemics, quite literally. That's the name of his book. And he's been talking a lot about what the past actually tells us. And I think, Chinmay, one thing that I was struck by was that you wrote about how there are usually four phases in the response to a pandemic. Denial, confusion, acceptance, and erasure. We've quite clearly gone through denial and worse. Where are we now? Sorry, let me just unmute you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think this is the stage of you know acceptance in the second phase. But when I was writing the book last year, I was what I had in mind was the age of pandemics in the you know 19th and early 20th century. I did not know really that we would go through all the four stages in one year itself, and there was some sort of a remarkable erasure which I think you know started happening from I think maybe say November to February, uh, and as a result of which, when things started picking up in Feb end in Maharashtra and then in March, again you know we went through this whole entire cycle of first denial, people saying oh there's no second wave. And then there was confusion about, you know, what to do about it. And of course, now we are all accepted. You know, most states are going into lockdown. It's spread so, so far and so deep that there's really nothing else to do apart from, unfortunately, locking down, which is, as the Prime Minister said, the last resort. Uh, and now, I mean, the, the real question is, you know, how fast at the, the pace that they are erasing the memory of even the first wave, which was also, you know, brutal, which also had the migration crisis, which you chronicled. Uh, you know, what is it that we are doing? in terms of not preventing erasure. I think that's very important. Uh, because I think what, I'm, what I argue in my book is that societies which have erased less uh, do better the next time around. They're less likely to be in denial. Think of uh, many of the East Asian countries which have had you know, relatively some success till date. They were faced with SARS and swine flu in the last 20 years. Think of Kerala and the Nipah virus in 2018. So it's that prior exposure, that, that learning of how to deal with pandemics as I think, you know, uh, held them in, uh, in good stead. And of course, we had the, you know, we had the preparation uh, uh, possible, uh, given that the first wave had come. But unfortunately, you know, we are, we are stuck in a, a big mess right now. What has been the biggest mistake when you look at the past and you look at the second wave handling? I think, you know, but I think the biggest thing is triumphalism. You know what? There's this amazing sense of triumphalism, which kind of emerged last year after the wave started uh, peaking in mid middle of September. Uh, and I can just tell you, even from basic, you know, conversation with friends, family, and so on, this, this idea about immunity, you know, which is probably the buzzword of uh, the last two years, uh, 
in fact, a strange kind of schadenfreude where we would look at the numbers in US, Germany, UK, and instead of saying, you know, as you interviewed Dr. Rajendra Bharu, instead of saying, look, this can happen to us, we were saying, oh, look, they are suffering and, you know, we've done amazingly well and we have fantastic immunity. This idea of some sort of a natural immunity is probably, you know, the, the weakest link in this entire thing that we've experienced in the last one year. Because what a pandemic does is precisely to generate new strains, new pathogens, which we really don't understand. And so we need to have the humility. You know, uh, and when I compare with the 1918 influenza pandemic, you know, that was an age where of very high mortality across diseases, life expectancy rate in India was just about 20 years, today it's 70 years. So that, that was an age where people knew that diseases come, they can be deadly. And people, though the influenza was really, truly deadly, you know, people were definitely had some sort of a respect in the sense that we have to be on guard. I think what we saw last year was a complete abdication of that, especially after September. And that sort of triumphalism, instead of learning from what's going wrong or you know why this second wave is happening, monitoring the strains, this sense of triumphalism, which I would say you know I have not really seen in past pandemics uh, to such an extent where we started boasting end game of the pandemic, you know, very very premature uh, statements. As I write in my book, even during the plague, for example, you know the British celebrated after the first year in 1896, 97, saying they have stamped out plague. And that was one of the worst you know, uh, statements they could have made because plague haunted India for at least 25 more years. And the peak mortality of plague was 1 million deaths in 1907 or so. So this premature celebration, I think the first lesson from past pandemics is literally never to celebrate the end of a pandemic for the simple reason you don't know when it ends. Uh, one should just you know, uh, uh, see how this disease goes and be on guard. I think you know, uh, the authorities which have done well so far across the world have been consistently on guard and not really boasted know about why they are they are achieving success what does the past tell you about the collapse of government of official institutions and the stepping in of civil society one of the things that's really striking about this moment is how people are turning to each other and when they tag each other on social networks they no longer even tag government institutions and i remember meeting the brother of someone at a cremation ground who told me in hindi we are in God's hands. And that is if you believe in God. If you don't believe in God, then you're absolutely desolate. What, how does that draw with the past? I think, I mean, there are obviously strong similarities that I see. You know, I've spent a lot of time going through old newspapers, you know, documenting day by day. Just like we have a daily scorecard of deaths. You had a daily scorecard of deaths for Delhi, Bombay, even in the you know, previous years, especially during 1980. Uh, you know, that time the public health infrastructure was practically non-existent. We say it is non-existent today, but you have to really imagine 100 years back how it would have been, right? And so the fact that, say, let's take, you know, influenza 1918, when it came, it was in the context of World War I. So the best doctors were actually serving in, you know, Mesopotamia and, and, and in the Middle East. So we didn't even have the, the leading doctors, you know, in India. Uh, the fact that the third worst drought in recorded Indian history hit four months before that, sort of a year of complete misery. And, you know, you see very similar things happening back then. Uh, I've seen a lot of letters to the editors. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have WhatsApp. But, you know, as communication, letter to the editors is very powerful. And, you know, after a point in the first few months, that is, you know, June, July, August uh, 1918, they were kind of criticizing the government saying, you know, government should do more. But by the time you reach October, November, where you were, you know, seeing crazy number of deaths per day, the letter to the editors were for the Social Service League or, you know, what we call a civil society organization. It's absolutely the same thing what you're seeing today. That is, everyone had given up on the government and they're saying, can this, you know, noble uh, social work department please come to our district? You know, districts were crying SOS at that time. So clearly, you know, when a pandemic goes out of hand as it is right now, uh, the whole faith in the government system collapses. Uh, and so I think we have seen this in the past. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that you think that 100 years later, you would have invested. I mean, there have been improvements, you know, as I said, life expectancy was 20 years, today it's 70 years. There has been incremental progress over 100 years. But we've never had a pandemic of this sort, you know, and it, 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 I think that's one of the reasons I think so many people have just been caught out by this. Because, yes, HIV AIDS was dangerous, but that was a slow moving pandemic. The nature of transmission was completely different. You know, it, it took years really for that to settle in. This takes a few days, a few weeks. And so we really don't have in living memory experience of dealing with it. And that's why we need to, you know, learn from what people did back then, because I do think there are strong similarities. But on this point of, you know, government collapse, I think 1918, something very similar happened. 
and people just had you know each other uh, to drive. and i've gone through you know when i read pick up the newspaper every day today it's amazing how how many headlines i feel i have just seen you know in during my research on say 1918 or during the plague uh, from the stuff on cremations wood running out today i think i saw something corpses in the river you know the ganga was choked with with corpses in 1918 uh, and i should say that the daily death rate was much higher actually in 1918 uh, than today uh, so so a lot of similarities in terms of you know seeing but as i said there was a key difference that even the government kind of realized you know this is a british government in the context of world war they also you know the the context out there was there was no triumphalism you know that's the unfortunate part that i'm seeing today is that there's still no real sense of the seriousness on the ground when you see at least the public communication from you know the the, the people in the highest office so that's the stark difference that i see between 1918 and now can you talk a little bit about the class dimension like in some ways i'm calling this the 2611 of the health world it's almost as if in the first year because it impacted the poor the migrant workers in an inordinate way the country did not necessarily respond in the way that it's responding now there is a class dimension and from there there is also a push back a very peculiar push back to wanting to see the cremation pyres to wanting to see the burial uh, gra uh, graveyards and in fact it's become a deeply politicized right wing versus liberal liberal debate absolutely i mean all i'll say is that you know the media 100 years back also showed the photographs they also had i mean we unfortunately don't have good evidence on 1918 but during the plague cholera you know we have good illustrations cartoons a variety of you know visual material to point out the crisis that was unfolding back then your point about you know class dimensions is absolutely right last year we saw this horrific you know migration completely unnecessary migration crisis uh, and still i don't think people uh, people thought that last year's handling of the pandemic was phenomenally good because the death rate was low in relationship with us and again the triumphalism you know you see it in documents like the economic survey of india where they show a table where comparing india with the 20 worst performers in the world but any sane analysis would you know compare india with all the countries of the world that's 200 odd countries and we were performing less on a per capita basis than bangladesh than pakistan than nepal than sri lanka last year right so there was no real ground for triumphalism last year uh, and so it's it's very unfortunate that you know we we, we saw this uh, uh, unfold last year and this year we don't have the migration crisis uh, but the class dimension is there because the minute as i said you know we were having a discussion on lockdowns earlier whether it's a state mandated lockdown or when the, when the pandemic runs out it's a people mandated lockdown where people are just too scared to venture out either way you know people's livelihoods are getting trounced and so last year was horrific for a huge class of india uh, this year is also unfortunately the next few months are going to be horrific and i still don't see the uh, kind of fiscal you know uh, the at least the relief efforts uh, the fiscal payouts to kind of measure up as to the you know the loss that people are uh, doing so that's also something which we could have learned from last year you know that is we know restrictions are important but restrictions with relief uh, and i'm not seeing that relief being uh, sort of commensurate with how many restrictions uh, we're putting in the prickliness to western media the prickliness to criticism the organized attempt at you know coming after journalists like myself and others who are calling out the government response the lancet is calling it out pretty unequivocally how does that compare to the past you know i think again uh, you know obviously when we're talking about the past we're talking about british rule in india and obviously they did have censorship and you know very strong control of media but you know look at say a, a newspaper like the times of india which was a british owned newspaper with a british editor you know they had a headline saying 6 million deaths inadequate arrangements you know these are the words of the british run editor this is this was the mildest newspaper in india you had newspaper like the bombay chronicle which were out and out smashing the the british government of the day i mean the indian press back then you know you had gandhi's newspaper calling the british actions as you know killing people like rats without sucker so you had really strong media backlash in 1918 in particular you know criticizing calling out the government in my book i also point out an american senator pointed out that you know how is it that millions of people are dying in the us and that the global world attention has not woken up so there were concerns and there were concerns in britain as well uh, and obviously you know all our you know fa infamous events during british rule whether it was the great famine of 1876 78 
But there's a Bengal famine of 1943. You've had some really brave journalists who have gone out, documented with photographs uh, and shown the world. We would not really have known the Bengal famine's horrors without people, you know, going there and taking those, uh, you know, costly photographs. Uh, so, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, media and, and the role it plays. But from a vantage point of looking at history, all I can say is that, you know, we are, the little that we do know about past horrors is actually thanks to an alert media. And that is why we need to have, you know, an alert media, if nothing to tell us where the excesses are happening so that the government can go and you know, reach those places. How do you see the fact that nationalism has crept even into this conversation? Yeah, well, not at all surprised because, you know, this is what we've been seeing for a long time now. Uh, nationalism in order to galvanize, you know, a country to respond to the pandemic, you know, I really don't have too much of a problem with that. But a nationalism to put down, you know, efforts to chronicle the pandemic is, is really worrying. Uh, I should just, you know, in, in my book, I have a quote from the Arthashastra. And the Arthashastra has a paragraph which says it is the duty of the government to take back, you know, accurate medical information from the ground. And it is, you know, it, the Arthashastra says that, you know, it is a punishable offense if a, a, a ground, you know, a, the field staff is not accurately reporting the information. You know, so these are kind of injunctions from our own sort of ancient texts, which kind of tell you about, you know, so-called good governance practices. Uh, and I'm in Ahmedabad right now, you know, journalists like Deepak Patel are showing just the kind of under-reporting which is happening in terms of uh, uh, deaths. The cremation in, grounds. Yeah. So maybe a factor of eight or 10 in certain crematorium grounds. I, I don't think that's the factor overall at India level. But definitely, you know, the fact that people uh, want to have, have the death certificate saying COVID-19, but they're not getting such death certificates, kind of shows you that, you know, there's clearly, if we don't have good data, we really don't know how to respond. You know, and I think, I, you know, I can just tell you from my vantage point, Gujarat, I have seen the local press for many years now. It is very heartening to see the local press, you know, being all out, you know, just calling it, calling a spade a spade on the front page of the newspaper. Today, Gujarat Samachar had a massive headline, you know, saying what is going on in Gujarat and so on. So it's it's heartening. I think in particular the uh, the, the Gujarati different newspapers, Sandesh, Gujarat, uh, Gujarat Samachar, uh, are, are doing a good job. I would say in publishing those obituaries, putting strong headlines, uh, and that's the job of the media. One would imagine. So while there is a nationalism, I think that is more like Twitter-based nationalism. My sense is that on the ground, people are seeing the ground reality is terrible. Uh, and they really feel, because they've been reporting the government side for many years, but I think they themselves have lost many people in the pandemic. And so that sort of churn is... So I'm not too worried because I think the nationalism is coming from those who have always kind of, you know, uh, projected it in, in that way. Uh, but what, is the, what does the past teach us about accountability? One of the questions that have been asked repeatedly is why we have not seen the present team sacked, a new team put up, an acknowledgement of a mistake. We have neither seen an acknowledgement of mistake nor of humility. Instead, we've seen a kind of doubling down from the government in terms of its aggression. I think, you know, what's surprising, even in the British times, uh, accountability came obviously not by you know, sacking ministers or, or, or government officials, but a change in policy. You know, like classically, the interventions, the Epidemic Disease Act that we're using now to uh, uh, squash COVID was started during 1897, during the plague. Uh, and we had stalwarts like, you know, Gokhale, Tilak, who kind of emerged, Sardar Patel in Ahmedabad much later on, who emerged to kind of, you know, take on the government in these uh, things. And the government did respond. You know, they one of the nice things about the British rule was that after every disaster, they did have a commission. You know, they had a fact-finding commission. And you might argue that it was blatantly partisan and so on, but they did contribute incrementally to the producing knowledge to, you know, by the time, you know, by the time you reach the 1920s, we did not really have too much of cholera, plague and so on. And that's because every year the government started putting out, you know, good data, good uh, amount of uh, 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 independent commissions and so on. And so that's, that's how you get accountability. You need an independent non-partisan commission to lay out the facts. And I thought, you know, that would be set up last year itself. I think there was a parliamentary standing committee. I've not seen that report. But we now really need an independent commission to lay out first the actual number of deaths. I think that's very important to tell you the scale of the tragedy because I think there's, you know, significant underreporting. And for example, the influenza, the government's numbers were 6 million. Uh, that entire generation thought it was 6 million, which was about the same as, you know, people dying in famines at that time. Uh, I have put the estimates, others have now put the estimates closer to 20 million, you know, three times more. Wow. So that is a level of underreporting. And that 20 million figure is probably the greatest demographic shock ever seen. And yet, you know, 
it did not really become the kind of plank I, the indian freedom fighters at that time you know pointed out to famines famine was the best word but nobody really pointed out to pandemics because there's no clearly identifiable enemy so to speak with pandemic and that's why it makes accountability you know that much more difficult and so for accountability you need to point out how exactly the government feel. we know pan it's a pandemic you know that despite the best measures some excess mortality is going to happen unfortunately but you know are you then at least taking the right you know steps in terms of mitigation are you listening to the science and unfortunately what we've seen in the last 3 months it is really impossible i think to defend any of the central government's action in terms of you know uh, going ahead with what they did as late as april 17th uh, the prime minister of india was tweeting about his rallies uh, in west bengal the size of his rallies at a time when you know the cases had already exploded. April 17th you know I can still imagine February 17th but yeah. April 17th was just too too late in into this pandemic uh, so there was a very very late course correction uh, in out here where are we now in this pandemic there's also a sense of fatalism it's almost as if despite the fact that modelers are telling us from lancet to the indian institute of science in bangalore that we could see anywhere between 400000 to 1 million deaths by june or august in the absence of vaccines i don't know and i shouldn't say this i almost sense a kind of fatalism that people are going to to die yeah i mean you know atul gawande in his book being mortal has this lovely line saying hope is not a plan but it hope sometimes hope is the plan and i think that's unfortunately where we are right now because hope can never be a plan i mean you, you don't want to just leave it on saying okay let's see how this virus turns out i think at the earliest you know i've been tracking the mobility data uh, i do think up and bihar are eventually going to be the most hit uh, precise for two reasons one is you know weak medical infrastructure but two on the mobility numbers even today as we speak they have you know many districts which are pretty much at business as usual kind of uh, levels of you know, the mobility uh, uh, tracked by how people are moving within the cities and so on uh, as before the pandemic which is i think inexcusable most cities have cut back by at least 60% 80% so at the minimum you know we're saying no, no national lockdown variety of opinions are that my point is that we can we still have some policy options to minimize the damage there's a huge damage there's unfortunately that's uh, it's it goes without saying but there is still time i think tamil nadu is now going in for a lockdown which you'll see virtually every state now in in the state of a lockdown uh, but i do think until you know this virus is really squashed this particular wave is squashed one has to be very careful in even removing the restrictions we've seen when restrictions were removed in you know in 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 districts in maharashtra in march again the cases started going up and so on. so it's around us uh, so yes vaccination is important in the medium to long run but we don't have the stocks now all of us know that so it's going to really happen only by the end of the year middle of next year but in the medium we have to just start minimizing damage and that means many states especially up and bihar you know really have to cut back on mobility because they've announced these curfews but nobody is obeying them on the ground and the minute you have a lot of people on the you know going out uh, this pandemic is, is still very very much alive what is the way you understand the deep resistance to a national lockdown this time I, i think the 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 visuals last year of migrants you know uh, walking back was very hard hitting uh, and i think the government is obviously going to think twice and that's why i think a national lockdown is still possible as long as you're not shutting down the railways or at least not shutting down in the way that we did last year give a week's time or scale down rather than complete shutdown you know that sort of a national uh, uh, lockdown with with some sort of relief measures uh, cash handouts whatever so that is a much more uh, sustainable i think a uh, likely lockdown policy uh, you know i think the economic hit that we took last year was so deep because of that particular lockdown in the way it was done i think that's the re- reluctance is is there you know so i mean i can't help but see you know they they've consistently said that the lockdown was a great success but they refused to do it now you know again they they said demonetization is a success today we have more cash in the system than any time in the past cash to gdp ratio but they're not demonetizing now so there's the rhetoric that the demonetization or the national lockdown was a success but they're too scared to do it now because they know that it actually you know does have an outsized impact having said that i do think we're at a stage of a pandemic where whether the central government does or not every state is going to shut down in may and pretty much so we're looking at two months of a complete you know washout in any case 
And I think there was a strong case for a national lockdown, not the kind we had last year, but a much more coordinated kind of shutdown. But that time is anyway, too, they're anyway too late. I mean, what we've done is essentially let the virus go everywhere and then shut down rather than having an anticipatory one uh, like we had done last year. So last year, I mean, I, I should say the idea of the lockdown last year was very good. The argument against it was the way it was enforced. You know, they could have thought about at least one week to kind of give people time to go back and so on. Uh, I think this time, I think that experience of that migration crisis was so stark. The economic uh, uh, recession was so stark that I think the policymaker and the central uh, government uh, have kind of left it. I think there could be also be a very politically pragmatic reason saying that, you know, this is now up left up to states. So it's left to your governance saying that, you know, whether when you lock down, when you did not, it is the, it is kind of pushing the ball back to uh, the states. That could probably be the more uh, uh, politically pragmatic thing that they've done. What leaps out of, for you? Is it an abdication by the state? Absolutely. I think, you know, the fact that from, as I said, November to uh, February, uh, November 2020 to February 2021, the, the triumphalism was just stunning. You know, the fact that we had defeated this pandemic uh, and that others have to learn from what we did, when the fact is that we still don't know too much about the coronavirus. You know, I, I end my book with these two words, that is patience and humility. You know, th these are the words used by a plague officer uh, who, who had seen plague for about a decade in Punjab, uh, more than 100 years back. And he said, you know, earlier we were very excited that we were defeating plague and so on. But now we wait every year for plague to come with patience and humility. And that's how we kind of, I mean, we, it's, it's not fatalism. But it's an idea that, you know, there is something that we do not understand. We need to understand. But without understanding it, we cannot claim victory for sure. Right? And so that's why I think these two virtues are very important in pandemic management, you know, patience and humility. And I think that went completely out of the window, uh, you know, between February and November, uh, between November and February. How now, do you yeah. how do you read it now? How do you read the government government's response now? I think it's there's still, still a there's still a lot of silence. There's still a lot of absence of empathy. There's still a lot of absence of compassion, and there's very clearly an absence of humility. That's true. Yeah, I, I I I've still not seen. I think at some point somebody has to say, look, we you know we messed up, and now we're going to do this this this. We, there's no way this government is going to do that. From what we've seen in the last you know many many years, I thought we'll see at some point demonetization. You know, regret. Last year I saw. You know, uh, the government handles tweeting the success of demonetization, though we had more cash in our system than any time in the past. So I have absolutely no expectation that the government is going to show anything but Tom Tom. It's you know success. So they're going to have more drones of those oxygen uh, trains, uh, drone videos. They're going to have more of that. Uh, if anything, we've learned from the demonetization episode is that the government goes all out on the PR rather than you know cutting. So I have zero expectation that there'll be some sort of you know humility or empathy in this particular situation, which is really unfortunate. Finally, Vera, where, what is the timeline? Because you've already warned against triumphalism. You've warned against declaring the early end of pandemics, right? Uh, we are already talking about the third wave without having a plan for the second wave. This country and the way we function as people and societies is going to be changed every moment that we live through this. So just your overall sense as we close. I think, you know, this idea that if you're in the middle class or upper middle class and you have a set routine in the year where you have a vacation plan and so on, I think for a year or two, you, should, you know, you should just keep all of this at the back burner. Country is going through a lot. One should just, you know, just just be really count your stars that you're you know thankful that you, you're, you're alive. Uh, this is not something that is going to get over in one month. We might realize three years down the line that, yes, maybe it got over in June 2021, but that's highly unlikely. So which means that we are in this for, in my view, at least two years, uh, given that the vaccination itself is going to you know, take uh, until the, maybe the middle of next year. So from from today, where we are, that is May 2021, I would you know say a two year kind of and, and we should have a planning you know, for two years. Where do we see ourselves in two years? Uh, we should be in a system where we have massive overcapacity in all the stuff that we're deficient in right now, which means oxygen, you know, uh, beds and so on. Uh, like the BMC, you know, chief was telling, I think, uh, on one of these shows that 
you know, whether to, if there's a large scale festival, 3000 beds and there are no cases, should we shut it down? The cost benefit is such, let's keep it open for the next three yeah. years. You know, the cost is marginal to the kind of benefit you get because these cases can go up within a few days, within a few weeks. Right? So there's no point in winding down all these centers. Maybe we'll have to wind it down at some point. But for at least the next two years, let's be on a kind of war footing, you know, on the, on this particular uh, point. Because this so is not good. The one breach from the past and the one that seems like a history repeating itself. I think, yeah, this premature celebration, you know, that's really, uh, as I say, there, there are many, I think we can now collate the commandments of pandemic management. So the first one, let's say, is never celebrate the end of a pandemic. That should be, you know, uh, the, the tagline of any person who's managing yeah. a pandemic. The second one is, you know, uh, not to over speculate on the regional variations of cases and mortality. So, oh, why did Bihar escape lightly in 2020, you know, compared to Maharashtra? Why did India escape lightly compared to US? There is a kind of over obsession which gets you to all sorts of untested scientific hypothesis, or unscientific hypothesis like natural immunity and so on. So that's point number two, uh, which you know, which we, which is clearly different. In fact, this time you know, I see a lot of uh, 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 sort of over exuberance on on that. Uh, third, you know, I would say the fact that you know, while vaccines have rarely ended pandemics. Quick pandemics, smallpox and all are, are different. But you know, when the flu hit in 1918, it came and went. People didn't know what hit them. It it, it was kind of a living on a prayer, and then it went. You know, there was no role of vaccines to end that pandemic. People just kind of got lucky. So while vaccines are important, all of us have to get vaccinated. The fact is that it's vaccine plus other things. You know, a vaccine plus common sense of not having large gatherings for at least some time. You know, stuff, stuff like that, which is going to kind of get us through. So while you know, vaccine now has kind of become the buzzword, we we all kind of we should not also not kind of believe that the vaccine will be the only way to end the pandemic. It's a huge part of ending the pandemic, but it is not the the, the only way. Uh, so prevention and cure, you know, these are the two kind of classic things in, in medical science. Uh, and the last thing I would say is that you know, as we started off by saying, the four stages of a pandemic: denial, confusion, acceptance, erasure. We should not erase. You know, and I think we need commemoration. We need uh, kind of memorials. We need maybe a day, you know, a national, you know, pandemic remembrance day. Uh, we need uh, we need to start teaching this in our school textbooks. You know, uh, more people have learned about World War One in our school textbooks than the influenza pandemic. Though the influenza pandemic killed more people in the world as well as in India, you know, thanks to World War One. Uh, we need to learn about these things. I know for a fact that doctors don't learn this in medical school. So even if not in schools. Medical schools should learn about the history of pandemics, not only this pandemic, but in the past. So it has to be very right. systematic. And we also owe it to our people to count all our dead. Absolutely. And, you know, this is something which I'm very keen to work on. So I'm, you know, I'm definitely on this because I've done this for 1918 and my underreporting factor was three times. That is 6 million reported, 20 million was the actual. Uh, I hope this time it's not more than three. You know, people, I mean, people are banding about all sorts of numbers, 10 times more, 20. But I can tell you anecdotally from yeah. creation grounds I've reported on, the gap is three to four times. Correct. Yeah. So I think, so that's, yeah, so that's something which we all, I think journalists have a role to play, researchers have a role to play. And this is something definitely that I'm going to work on. So I think we owe it to ourselves to know the extent of the tragedy. Uh, and, you know, if people say that, you know, this is negativity, you know, uh, sorry, but this is, this is accuracy. And I think accuracy is important. Thank you for saying that, Chinmay. And uh, as you said, I think there's so much about the past that hangs over the present and that we can learn from. Thank you for your excellent book on the age of pandemics and a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Take care. Thank Bye. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalists.